So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. That's what I'm supposed to be doing here initially. And I'll tell you what you would have seen if this thing was working. So the first slide uh, has my name, which is David Spring. And I have a master's degree in education. I taught at Bellevue College for 20 years, and I'm kind of now retired. And what I do is I basically build like hundreds of websites. Uh, there is information. We're, today we're going to talk about District Weeks, a new way to share Linux. There is information about it on our website called distrotweaks.org. Then uh, all of our courses are on a different website called collegeinthecouds.org. And then we have a website uh, where we teach courses in Linux and LibreOffice that also has a lot of information about district weeks. That is called learnlinuxandlibreoffice.org. And finally, if you don't remember any of the rest of them, my home website that has links to all 50 of my websites is called davidspring.org. Now, is that on either of these sheets? I don't know if it's on those sheets, but nevertheless, my name is on there, David Spring, and also College in the Clouds is on there, and that will link to um, the District Creek's website. Okay, and you could also just email me. My email address is on there. You can contact me. We will get you to the correct website. So... My wife said there's a picture of the Lennox penguin here, and it's supposed to be the Lennox penguin holding a lightsaber because we're going to deal with the evil empire here. The goal of District Weeks is to defeat the evil empire. Anybody know what the evil empire is? What's the evil empire? Microsoft and Apple. I, Microsoft, well, actually Apple too, but in general when they're talking about the evil empire, they're talking about Microsoft because they kind of, at least at one point, had a kind of a monopoly. That appears to be changing. So, now I have... Um, a little bit about myself, or like I said, for 20 years I taught courses at Bellevue College. There's something significant about Bellevue College. It is the closest college to Microsoft. And so most of my employees, most of my students, were Microsoft employees. I actually have um, more than 1,000 Microsoft employees in my classes over 20 years, maybe even 2,000, and including some of Bill Gates' personal assistants. <coughs> And I know more about the history and the evolution of Microsoft, maybe than anybody in the world. I wrote a book about this called Free Yourself from Microsoft and the NSA that describes the real history of Microsoft. That's a website that you can go to and learn about that. You can download a free book there. Hundreds of thousands of people have already downloaded that book. In 1993, I started one of the world's, I started some of the world's first websites, and including one of the world's first online stores one year before Amazon started. Some of my students started Amazon. And then, since then, I have built, like I say, hundreds of websites, and I teach courses in website construction and coding and HTML and CSS and all that fun stuff. And then for years, I also taught courses in Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office um, until 2012. In 2012, anybody know what happened to Microsoft in 2012? <laughs> Actually, plenty of stuff happened over the years. But anyway, that's when Windows 8 came out, the, the pre-versions of it. And that's also when they launched a startup program called UEFI. U-E-F-I. Anybody know what the word UEFI means? Anybody heard of this? I just want to see how many of you... Okay. Anybody running a computer with UEFI? You want to read the book for yourself from Microsoft and the NSA. It will tell you the true story of UEFI. But at any rate, I discovered this, all these things, and that led me to switch to the Linux operating system and to move away from UIFI and towards something called Core Boot. Now, then in um, June of 2013, so it took me several months to research all of this, and I was about to publish this book, For Yourself from Microsoft and the NSA, the first week of June of 2013, and what happened then, oops, Oh, you can almost see this. You can see that little slide that I'm doing right there. There it is. See in 2007? That's an Edward Snowden slide. And it said in January of 2007, Microsoft joined the NSA, the prison program of the NSA. Now, I had already written about September 1st of 2007 in my book. What also happened in September of 2007 was Bill Gates and Microsoft took over UEFI. The dates are identical. The NSA prison program and UEFI are the same. So whenever you're using your UEFI, you're basically using the NSA's own startup program, which means it has a kill switch, where they can turn off your computer if they decide they don't like what you're saying. 
And that's why at some point you want to move over to core boot computers. Right now, there's only a few people making core boot computers. All Google Chromebooks use the core boot starter program. That's what this computer is. It's kind of a Google Chromebook computer. And then the, um, there's also, I think, um, a, a company called Pure OS that is doing work on core boot. And they have a core boot computer that the uh, Chromebooks you can get for two or three hundred dollars, up to five hundred, and the Purism computers are like about a thousand six hundred dollars. But I really love those guys, and so we talk about that in our books and in our courses about what your options are. But we're not going to talk about UFE today. We're going to talk about something else. So I've been teaching courses in Linux and LibreOffice, and we have, um, and also courses in publishing books and building websites through CollegeInTheClouds.org. And so that's a little bit about me. And now we're going to have a couple of survey questions. I just want to find out how many of you have used the Linux operating system. Raise your hand if you've used the Linux operating system. How about how many of you use the Windows operating system? Windows? Okay, how about the Apple operating system? Apple people? A few Apple people. How many of you use the Google operating system? Chrome OS. Oh, wow, we have a few Chrome OS people. I bought my daughter a Chromebook. Uh, a few years ago, and we, I was doing this presentation for my wife and my daughter last night, and I asked her, what is the operating system on a Chromebook? She said, Windows. <laughs> okay, whatever. It's actually the Chrome operating system. How many of you use BSD? Anybody? Yay, good for you, a couple of BSD people. And then how many of you use several operating systems? Okay, whatever, just whatever happens to be on the computer. Um, so I don't, there's been some things that have happened recently. And I'm not going to go with history because we don't have time for this. But recently, so the Amazon cloud is using Linux servers. They're very proud about this. When, how many of you heard of Meltdown Inspector? Any? Okay, so most of you have heard of Meltdown Inspector. This is good. So these are kind of Intel, like little <coughs> problems and t problems with processors that mainly affect Windows computers and mainly affect Windows server computers uh, because the Windows operating system is too slow. So. And what basically Intel was trying to do was hide the fact that it was slow. So let me just get on the correct thing here. We're asking the survey question in case this ever comes up. The, um, and so what, 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 unfortunately, they used something called speculation, which was guessing or gambling about what was going to happen. Then they would just try to load the Windows operating system even before you wanted it loaded. And they would even not unload it even when you wanted to unload it. It was amazing. But unfortunately, that led to some security problems, and they have to get rid of all that speculation, or at least isolate it. And this dramatically slows down Windows computers, and particularly Windows servers. Microsoft learned this about a year ago, and immediately started switching the Microsoft Cloud over to Linux servers. You probably have heard that the entire Microsoft Cloud is now going to be running on Linux servers, not Windows servers within the next year, over, already over 70% of the servers have been switched over and the remaining 30% will go over in the next year or two. So the server war is over. <coughs> Linux has won the server war. So now that uh, Amazon, Google, and the Microsoft Cloud are all using the Linux operating system, how many of you are happy that Linux is monopolizing the server market? Ready? Make your hand. Oh, I am. <laughs> okay. Yay. <laughs> to me, this is a drink come true. But anyway. <coughs> How many of you would like to see oh, Linux replace the Windows monopoly in the desktop market? Okay, they still have, uh, win Windows still kind of dominates the desktop market, but how many of you know that they now have a Linux subsystem on Windows? So you can use, now you can run Linux programs on Windows, just like you can run Windows programs on Linux through like Wine or Emulation or Virtual Machine. All right, so now, <coughs> A question a lot of people have, this is where it relates to distro tweaks. Why hasn't distro, so distro tweaks has already taken over the server market. We understand it needs to be fast, it needs to be secure, and that's what Linux is, and that's basically why everybody's going in that direction. Desktop computers don't need to be fast. They don't need to be secure. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe they do. So the, um, the question is, why hasn't Linux already taken over the computer desktop market? Anybody got any ideas? Cumbersome. It's, it's, it's cumbersome if you're not a techie. If you're not a techie, it's a little bit hard to work with. Go ahead. There's a steep learning curve. 
There's kind of a steep learning, although there is kind of a learning curve to Windows, too. Yeah. Because no one has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising <laughs> okay. to convince people that's what they need to be using. Okay, ding, ding, ding. That's one. You got a good one there. Go ahead. Lack of commercial and business software for end users? Oh, actually, the personal and business software for the end users may be better on Linux. And on Windows. that's a good point that people, really what it is, is the public schools. The public schools teach the Windows operating system. So people don't realize there's a steep learning curve to Windows because they've been using it since they were a child. And they get used to using Windows programs. And so they think that the Windows programs are better for business, whatever. But, but what, if we can convince the schools to use Linux, that might change. Yeah? I'd say inertia. Inertia is a big one. Uh, people have trouble with change, but you know what's happening? The world changes whether we want to or not. In fact, this morning we're going to be talking a lot about change and how we can make that change easier and faster. In particular, what I want to do, I'm a teacher. I want to make the Linux easier and faster for teachers to help their students. That's what it's all about for me. Now, the fact that there's all kinds of other things you can put a distro link to is just icing on the cake. But mainly what I want to do is I want to help college instructors and high school instructors adopt the Linux operating system, and they will turn around and teach it to their students. So that's kind of partly what we're going to be doing here, and I believe that we can kind of change the world. So Linux also does not come pre-installed on computers. You have to put it on the computer, okay? We want to make that installation process easier. Linux also, it, when you do these customizations, you oftentimes want to have to do them one at a time. When you add applications and install them, sometimes you have to install them in the terminal or dev files or all kinds of other crazy stuff. I want to eliminate all of that. What I want to do is make it a very simple process where they put on the operating system in a few minutes, and then they put on what's called the district week on top of the operating system. And so district weeks is an attempt to address some of the major drawbacks. Right now, that's preventing Linux from taking over. And my hope and belief is that if enough people adopt district weeks, Linux will eventually and rapidly surpass Windows. Now, uh, so it makes customizing Linux much faster and easier. It makes installing programs easier. And because that makes life easier for teachers and colleges, hopefully they will translate this information to the students. So I have a, a, a beautiful slide here. I work on these slides for weeks, okay? <laughs> the fact that you're not seeing any of this is part pretty much a shame. But nevertheless, uh, I believe the district takes may be the final nail in the Windows operating system coffin. I believe that Meltdown and Spectre were huge huge, almost insurmountable problems, uh, but, and there were other problems before this, but the, we're going to hopefully district tweaks will be kind of the last nail in the coffin. So now we're going to get to something you guys have a, the slides on that my wife helped me do, which is the graphics, okay? So it's called, uh, there's a little kind of colored graphic here that you guys get to see here, it's sitting on your hair. We're going to talk about the slides, you can actually see things for a couple seconds. It's staying up for now. Oh my god! Oh. Oh. <laughs> So the moment I get this, there it is. Okay, now, so what this is a story of the four little pigs, and we're going to do this pretty fast. The first little pig built his home out of straw windows, and it was locked out because he failed to make the monthly payments. How many of you made monthly payments to Microsoft? I have, all my students, all my friends do, they pay Microsoft like, I don't know how much a month. But nevertheless, if you don't make your payments, there goes your computer. The second little pig built a home out of wooden apples, and they didn't need to, the wolf didn't need to blow the house down because he had a secret kill switch. Every Apple and every Windows computer, every one of them, uses UEFI. Every UEFI computer has a kill switch. That your computer could be gone, and I mean it turns it into a brick. You are not getting your data back, you are not turning it back on, you're not doing anything, it's gone. Now, the third little pig built his home out of Linux, and the problem was it was a secure home, but it only had a few rooms in the home. And so then the fourth little pig built his home out of Linux, but he added a district so he can suddenly add a 20-room mansion which he shared for free with all his friends. Okay, so that's that. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. That was the graphic. Okay, now back to the regular stuff. Okay, so my problem. Imagine you guys are all my students, and I've got 30 students in my class, and I am going to teach you how to build websites. And all of your computers need to look exactly like my computer. Not kind of a picture of a typical college classroom. This is another picture. But, but we'd all have computers. We'd all be sitting around. I, and we've got to get the screens looking the same. I could spend half of a class and half 
uh, over the past 10 or 20 years, trying to get all the students' screens kind of looking like my screen. Here are some of the changes that I make to Linux Mint. So I put on the Linux Mint operating system, and I make dozens of changes from uh, management settings and uh, changing the swappiness settings of the computer so that it doesn't you know, uh, destroy the SSD, uh, changing some of the printer settings, adding applets and desktops and window themes and all kinds of stuff. That's just to the Linux Mint operating system. And then I add like a dozen programs on top of all of that. I change the timeout settings so that the screens don't actually go into hibernation. And then on top of that, I have to add, make a, about 40 or 50 changes to the LibreOffice program so that it will work in the way I want my students to use it. And I'm not even going to go over all those. Sort of, you can go online and see all the changes we make to LibreOffice. So we spent, and then we have students, hopefully this picture will show up here. Um, students are kind of like, um, not like you guys, okay? Oh, here we go. This guy's actually doing something for you. He's helping you. Oh, thank you. We really appreciate your help. Did you turn it back on? It's on. Oh, I just turned it off before I left. Okay, oh, perfect. What well, was working there for a second. This is VGA here. Now, so what happens is, I want you guys to think about this. If we're going to get Linux to work, we need people like this lady to be able to use Linux. We can't just say, well, it's fine, I could use Linux, but it doesn't matter if nobody else can. My students don't even know how to right-click <coughs> with their mouse. We have classes on right-clicking with your mouse. They don't know how to create a folder because we put folders inside of folders. Websites are all about folders. If you can't create a folder, you're not going to be able to do a website. Now, I'm sure all of how many can create a folder? Okay, how many can right click? Okay. So, what we need to realize is that the general public is different from a lot of Linux people, and we need to make it a lot easier. And that's what this distro tweak system is all about. So, what is a distro tweak? He's still working on it. He's trying really Sorry. hard. I really appreciate your help. Maybe if I just move this back this way, it will. It will. Maybe it's a connection issue. I don't know. He's going to try to solve it. Let's see, then I can't see. That's a good word. Okay, we'll put it here. All right, so there's a term that we use with Joomla websites, and I'm going to get to this in a second. A district is simply a process. It's not any particular file or program. It's a process of things that you do. It's a series of steps of where you can create your own district, where you load your own district, uh, where you share your own district. Those are just like a series of steps. So it's a process. You could do it. You don't need my help. After you go to the website, we have the complete instructions. You do your own district feeds. You share it with your friends. You share it with your students. Whatever you want to do, you have the complete freedom. And it replaces the old process of making changes one at a time, and every time you have another student or another computer, you have to do everything all over again. So you install the distro on like a clean computer, you add the distro tweak, and then you have a custom distro. It's really that simple. Now, we have a term, and the English language is not entirely clear. So I want to clarify a couple of terms. And this is the difference between a tweak and a hack. Now, I know some of you guys may think that tweaks and hacks are the same because the English language is not clear on this issue. But in the Joomla community, and I use the Joomla platform for building websites rather than WordPress because I like the structure of Joomla better than WordPress. I think it's a better structure. But nevertheless, so what I'm really familiar with is the Joomla community. And in Joomla, they have the Joomla program. And the Joomla program was made like about 10,000 people put it together. It's kind of like Linux. It's a community of It's like a whole pile of people. And they put together something that has about a half million lines of code, about 500,000 lines of code, and that's called the Joomla core. And you're not, you can change the Joomla core if you want. It's open source. If you want to do it with your website, go for it. You, you, you know, crash your website, that was your problem. But, but so you have the core, and if you make changes in the core, they call it a hack. Hacking the core. But if you only make minor changes around the edges, some of the parameters and add stuff to the core, that is called a tweak. See the difference. And that's why we're calling this a distro tweak. We're taking a Linux distribution and we're making minor changes. We are not changing the core. And this is kind of a little bit different from a clone. Because in a clone, you would clone both the operating system and the customizations together. No, 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 we don't want to do that because we want somebody else handling the core. 
whoever, if you're with Arch or Debian or Ubuntu, those are the people who should be handling the core, and we're going to do like we do with Joomla. We kind of isolate the core. We put it over here. Somebody else is doing that. And we're going to do all this little minor stuff, the stuff that the customers see on the front end, what WordPress would call a theme and what Joomla would call a template, kind of the little stuff that the public sees. And so that's the difference between a tweak, where you have minor modifications that typically do not cause problems, and with an update, you don't have to worry about at the update of the core how that's going to affect it. Yeah, go ahead. So is it kind of like a skin? It's like a skin, but it's different from the skin. I'll get back to that in a second. Yeah. Couldn't that be done with like Puppet Chef or Ansible? Yes. So uh, both of the, there are lots of ways of doing this, but this is a slightly different. So a skin, and correct me if I'm wrong what you mean by this, on top of the um, like families of operating systems, you know, Linux has about a couple hundred operating systems, and they have families of operating systems, and then on top of that you have what are called desktop environments, okay, or DEs. Now those desktop environments, we're not going to alter those either. We're going to let somebody handle that. This is also different from a snap or a container. We're not doing any of that type of stuff. This is completely different. What I want to do, I'm thinking of a college instructor or a high school instructor like me. I'm not thinking about a developer or programmer or anything like that. I want a complete <coughs> idiot to be able to do this. And I didn't mean to include myself in that group, but uh, we're, we're not. Um, we all specialize in what we specialize in. And we don't want to specialize in Linux. We want to let somebody else do that stuff. We, but what we do want to do is we got our students, and we got the course that we have to teach. And we want, a, we want the computer to be looking right for our students so we can teach our course. Okay, so we're not going to be doing any hacks. We're going to be making minor modifications, and then we're going to be very organized about that. So the old way, I did try, because keep in mind, I've had this problem now for like 20 years. I have been trying all kinds of things. We've been trying clones. I haven't been able, clones sometimes work, they sometimes don't work. I thought about starting my own distribution. That's how desperate we were. No, I am not, I don't have the time, I'm not good enough. So now what we're gonna have to do is, um, we're gonna have to come up, with, and so then I tried all kinds of other programs, like backup programs. Can I move your computer? You can move your, my computer wherever you want. So we tried all of the, and then we tried, there's a new thing that, um, called time shift. And we tried time shift. And the problem with time shift, which is a snapshot program. And the problem with it is you can make a snapshot and then you can put it on the same computer, but you can't put it on a different computer. Okay, because of what's called the UUID. Anybody know what a UUID is? Each computer has a UUID. Why do they gotta do this? Because you're back uh, up and running. I'm back up and running? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, so, whoa, and well, now we just, that's okay. That's just my power source. I don't even care about that. Sorry about that. Oh, don't worry about it. As long as I'm back up and running. Oh, this core here needs some work. Okay, we're yeah, going to yeah, move like that. Yeah, there's not slack on that. I'm just going to move over this way. And oh, here's as long a nice as chair for you. And it was that little core. Yeah, no, it's actually this this thing here that they're using to capture the video. It's it's freaking out. So it's I'm going to tell them about Yeah. Okay. But, but when, we plug, when we plug straight into the mixer, you're good to go. Okay. Uh, straight into the mixer. That's what <laughs> we really needed. We're about to get to the complex stuff. And so we, we they <laughs> solved our problem just in the next time. All this was not completely not necessary. But at any rate, so... I tried all these other things, and various things blocked my path. The guy who makes a program called Aptic makes the, uh, we're not going to do that here. So this is covers who should use district teach, but I'm going to kind of, there's all kinds of usages for this. What the guy did was he made another program called Aptic, and time shift. They're made by the same guy. Uh, and I was certain that Aptic wasn't going to work because time shift didn't work. But I was in due diligence, I'm going to try it anyway because I tried everything else and failed on everything else, so might as well try it. And it shocked me that it ignored the UUID. It allowed me to put, and I now put distro tweaks on dozens of computers where, and I go, yay, problem solved. And so now what we're doing is we're kind of sharing this with the world here. So teachers, obviously, schools, colleges, and universities. Unless you're at a school college, they have their own colors, their own programs, their own system they like to use, and they would like to get every teacher their own computer where everybody's doing the same thing at the college. And what do they do? They give them Windows computers. They have Windows servers and all this kind of stuff. Well, this will allow us to change all of that and say we can just use Linux instead. 
Uh, clubs and organizations also have their own <coughs> systems and computers and programs and stuff. And if you set something up for your club or organization, suddenly everybody in your club and organization gets that computer. Businesses, corporations, they want their staff to have identical computers. I was just at U Haul. Oh man, because we're moving from Seattle to Bellingham. Now, U Haul uses Windows computers. All the systems are crashing because Meltdown Inspector crashed their Windows 10 computers. They can't hardly get them to run. And you can't even hardly get a U-Haul trailer right now. Um, well, the people at U-Haul are probably going to be looking for something else at some point. And this would be an ideal system because they have their own programs and systems that would allow them to use that. And so people would do video editing or graphics programs, pretty much whatever you want to do. So instead of having a couple hundred Linux distributions, our goal is to create a world with a million versions of Linux. Everybody gets their own Linux, customized Linux distribution, and they get it installed with the click of a button. Okay, so now that we've got you excited about maybe I will go ahead and try this, I will help out or whatever, um, there's some steps. There's some problems. The first time I did it, I did not do it on a clean computer. Just talking to a guy downstairs about this. And I just put it on the computer and then copied it over, put it on another computer. Suddenly the other computer was just like my computer, including all of my passwords, all my settings, and everything else. And somebody could literally log into all my accounts, my email addresses and stuff. So you need a computer. This is kind of the one drawback of this that you're not using. It's not good to try a disk or tweak with a computer that you use in your everyday life. You have some computer that is basically for nothing but disk or tweaks, okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to make it completely clean. There's going to be nothing on the computer. You're going to install any Linux distribution you want. We've basically only tested Ubuntu and Linux Mint stuff. You can uh, use a dev file to uh, use it on Debian, and they are working on getting it to work on Arch and Fedora and everything else. Eventually, within a few months, it should be able to work on all. And if, if you are with Fedora or Arch or whatever, and you're a developer, you can, it's open source, you can just take the code and fork it, and then suddenly you got your Fedora version or whatever. Or yeah. work on subsets like Raspbian? Uh, no, I don't think so. But you can probably fork it and give it a work. I mean, a lot of this, it's basically a Ubuntu-based program, and it's using the hooks from Ubuntu, okay? And because this guy uses Ubuntu. And I happen to use Ubuntu, so yay, we solved the problem for us. But everybody else can have to solve the problem for them. He's trying to kind of broaden it out, but what he's going to do is to the big... He wants to do Arch and Fedora because, you know, they'll get mad if we don't do Arch and Fedora. Okay. <coughs> then you create... You need to be organized about this. You create a list of the changes that you want to make. All the programs you want to add, all the customization you want to do, so that you know exactly what the end result is going to be. And then you actually want to check off as you add, slowly add all of those customizations until you got it looking the way you want. Then you install uh, either through a dev file or PPA, you install Abtic. These are, uh, you have on your little code thing there, uh, the, the commands to get um, Abtic installed on your computer. Hopefully someday it'll be in the uh, Ubuntu software center, but it's not there yet. Then you start it up, you enter your password, you create a backup folder into the system and then this is what it will look like. Uh, you have it linked to the backup folder. And then uh, you can bring up a series of installed packages. You can review it. You can try to delete some of them. But what I do is I simply copy everything because I don't want to make it too complicated. Then this is the next screen. It's kind of what the whole thing looks like. You can see there's all kinds of options there. You can spend your entire life learning how to use this. Or you could just go to the bottom and click backup. You don't do it, you don't pay any attention to any of this stuff. You just back up everything, and then this is what it will look like after it's all done. It'll take a few minutes to back everything up, and it creates archives of all of the PPAs that you have put in there. It literally does everything, all the themes. Uh, what amazes me, its ability to copy over everything I did with LibreOffice. Because to me, LibreOffice is my main tool. It's not Linux, it's LibreOffice. But I've made so many changes to LibreOffice. I have added subprograms to called extensions onto LibreOffice. And I made changes in the subprograms. And I made changes inside of every one of the, um, the templates that are used to start LibreOffice in, in terms of all the styles. I've changed all that, it copied all of it. It went right, very deep down into the file system there. So then uh, that's what it'll look at like. And you can put it on a jump drive or you can put it on the cloud. Share it whatever way you want. 
then how you add it is, first of all, it, because my students do have like stuff on the computer that they like, we do have to take their stuff, put it in a folder, get their stuff off the computer because we're literally going to re-clean and restart the computer. And we're gonna, we want to put on not only, uh, like I use Linux Mint, um, you could use whatever distro you want, but you also have to have the same desktop environment. So there's several different versions of Linux Mint. You have to have that. It has to be all the same. So you get your live stick, and everybody gets the live stick. And everybody, <coughs> after they get all their documents off on a jump drive and stuff, then they put on Linux Mint, and we use Linux Mint Cinnamon. And then we install Abtic to it. And then we link Abtic to the file that we had and point Abtic at the district tweak folder, and you click Restore and suddenly they have a computer that looks just like my computer. You add back the documents and images, and now we're ready to start a class. Yay, 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 yay. And I can be certain that all my students have. Now, there are um, some problems that we've encountered uh, that we're working on. Uh, obviously, using a USB is one way to add it to student component. But, but, you know, I'm working online with students in Europe. They're not, I'm not going to be able to send them a USB or whatever. They're going to download it online. And the file size is a big problem because these files, you can imagine, you, you, you know, all these programs get over one gigabyte pretty fast and pretty tough to be sharing these large files. So what we're going to do is kind of change things a little bit. And the programs they, they can install by just clicking on the install button, we're going to let them do that. We're not going to put it on the disk for tweet. So depending on how you're working with your students or who you're working with, you may or may not... Um, you don't want to be adding on all the programs. You can help us. We have a website, districtweeks.org. You can help us test it. I'll get you to say the, um, a problem that we don't know about, will this work with all processors? Will it work with all computers? You know, we've tried it on several different brands, but we would really like to try it on more brands, on more computers, to see if there's any problems. Go ahead. Um, my question was, does it overwrite stuff that they already had in those programs? Oh, yeah. It overrides everything. So the, um, what we're doing is we're having just the students keep their documents. Um, but what we're going to do is create a computer for our class, whether it's to write a book or to do a website. We want to carefully control everything they do in the classroom. Now, if they don't, if they don't want to bring in a computer and have it wiped out and have it restarted, and stuff, we'll probably just supply them with a computer. Most colleges do supply their students in high schools they have a whole pile of computers. The instructor has access to 30 or 40 computers. And so the instructor is just going to start passing out computers if the student doesn't want to put it on their own computer. So, but, so I'm just thinking, would it be possible to have that, um, to have your Aptic file on a, um, like somewhere on cloud service or on network storage and then just have a bash script that runs at boot? Yes. Grab it and so that you can do updates on the fly. Whatever. Exactly. Just like you can have the whole Linux operating system kind of off on the side. And, and so, yeah, there's, you're going to have the creativity to do whatever you want with this. And, yes, people will find all kinds of things. That's the beauty of open source stuff. All kinds of things. That I'm just trying to solve my problem. And then if you've got a, a different way you want to do things, that would be fine. Yeah. Well, instead of having to wipe their computer, can it not run like Ubuntu from a, a CD yes. or a thumb drive? And Absolutely, boot, in a boot, live boot. session. It's, and you can have yeah. live session with the data, not the data and stuff. Yeah, yeah there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. But keep in mind, my students can't do any of this. You guys are so far, you are <coughs> almost a completely different, I don't know, planet than my students, okay? So my students are at a fairly basic level. And what we're trying to do is that the whole point to me of a district week is I have to lower the bar down to the level of my students so that we can, you know, they can feel good about the progress that they're making. We can continue with our class. So because I, I, I can't put it on my websites because my websites are Joomla websites and they're PHP-based websites. And PHP has a rule that they don't want you downloading large files onto PHP websites because, you know, in the database stuff, they don't like that. So... Uh, the most you can go, I believe, with PHP is like 500 megabytes, and these files in the past have been like a gigabyte or a thousand megabytes. And I, um, we're going to try to get them down under 5,000, so I can just put them on my website. Right now, I have it on a uh, cloud uh, mega dot nz, uh, which is fully encrypted and stuff. It's in New Zealand and stuff. And we have an access code. If you email me, I give you the copy of the access code. This is, we have two distro tweaks that we have created. One is for authors, because I teach courses and writing books. And another one is for like video people that want to do videos or like YouTube channels and stuff. 
Um, and you can download one or the other from the website and play with it if you want. Or you can just create your own distance tweak. You click on the link and then you click on the download button and then you enter the access code, click on the decrypt button. That's if you want to use one of our sample distro tweaks. And our goal is that people can send in their own distro tweaks and we will post that and, and we'll act as a kind of a, a, a place where people could get distro tweaks. Now there's some limitations here. The biggest limitation right now is that we're only competent about Ubuntu uh, distribution, the Ubuntu family. And we are somewhat competent about Debian. I don't actually use Debian that much, but the, uh, if you use Debian, you can give it a try. I'm sure it would work because it, it is a dev file after all. Uh, our concern is Fedora and Arch, and that is coming in the next few months. There's also some programs that do not work, and we don't know why they don't work. They don't have the right hook. There's something wrong with them. But nevertheless, the one that I like the best, which is a screen capture tool called Shutter, um, that doesn't work. And so what happens, thankfully, it's just, you know, in the software center and you just click on install and install it that way. And I've already mentioned that you really need to have the same desktop environment because the desktop environments themselves have hooks. The, the file structure is different. All these families have different file structures, all the desktop things, and, and basically what you're looking at is the service, but what's underneath, as you all know, is a whole pile of files and folders. And those things have to all be the same, and that's why you, you need to be kind of careful about what you're putting it on. And that is, and so our hope is that eventually uh, this concept is going to be able to help change high schools and colleges and eventually get it to the point where everybody, people no longer believe that Linux is hard. We want people to think Linux is actually easier. Now, Windows has only one operating system. Apple has only one operating system. What kind of makes Linux a little bit hard is that it has 200 operating systems. And then, what we were talking about earlier, people spend their entire life trying to figure out which one of the 200 ones they want to use. Well, they're all pretty good, okay, just kind of pick one. Or, and I, I, I put about 20 different operating systems on virtual machines, so I can try them all out on virtual machines. The general public isn't going to do that either. So what we're going to do is, well, the teacher knows their students the best. And by having teachers work directly with students, they can um, help build their level of competence. They can get them using the specific programs. And then hopefully in the future, I do believe, you know, how many of you would have thought five years ago or ten years ago that Microsoft would be using all Linux servers in the Microsoft Cloud? Anybody? Not me. Uh, and now, yeah, that's what happened. So people think, oh, it's going to be impossible to replace Windows. But I think as little as five years from now, you could see... Uh, 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 for example, Microsoft just released last week their earnings report. Did you guys see the Microsoft earnings report? Their stock went up. And why did it go up? Because they're making a boatload of money on the Azure cloud. They're making money off of Linux servers. Microsoft is making, they're happy. All Microsoft wants to do is make money. And I believe the day is going to come when you're going to see Microsoft promoting Linux for the desktop. So we just want to make everything kind of easier and we want to get people... What I would rather do is rather than running Linux program on a Windows computer, I'd rather people run a Linux program on a Linux computer. And that's what we're trying to do with this for tweaks. So, questions, comments? I, you were commenting about Microsoft. It was just announced in the, the new Spring Creators Update. They're enhancing uh, Linux. Yes, they joined the board of Linux. They are sponsoring Linux. I'm sure they're here at Linux Fest. How many people here work for Microsoft? Anybody work for Microsoft? Well, there's piles of them here. Um, how many people work for Google here? Now, Google is kind of different. Google doesn't like Microsoft too much. They're kind of competitors, okay? They want the Google Cloud. And the Amazon, well, no, our cloud is better. It was so funny. Amazon put out a press release after Meltdown Inspector saying, well, our cloud wasn't affected at all. The Azure cloud was affected, but not us, because we run Linux. And they literally, Amazon was running full-page ads promoting the fact that they run Linux. So I think you're gonna, Linux is getting a very good name out, out of Meltdown Spectre. Yeah? Aren't Spectre and Meltdown both at more of a processor level rather than the OS level? Well, what it does is this. Um, the mitigation is at the OS level. Yeah, well, so but actually... It, 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 well, they have to redesign motherboards. Now, right. Yeah, exactly. Now, so first of all, meltdown <coughs> sector are slightly two different things. Okay, right. but but um, what my view of uh, the problem? Okay, and I've said this for years. 
The reason I moved away from Windows 8, what was different about Windows 8 compared to Windows 7, is they tried to put two operating systems in the same thing with two control panels. I teach classes in computer programming. No, you don't do this. Who said you're going to do You do not use two operating systems and you make, try to make them one. They gave their employees a job that was too hard. Oh, somebody actually has to do the work there. This, whoever made that, and it was, by the way, that decision was made back in 2006 or 2007. They tried to merge the metro operating system with the standard operating system. Oh my God, what a nightmare. So you have that, and what they had to do was double their code, and they, their code became unbelievably bloated. Now, Intel kind of said, well, people are going to complain because your computer takes too long to start. So Intel used speculation or gambling, and this is what uh, Spectre means. It stands for speculation, okay? And what they do is they guess what you're going to do before you do it, and they pre-start Windows. So yes, it is uh, on the uh, you know chip level, but it was Intel trying to hide the problems of, of Windows. But now what they learned was you can't do that. That gambling is bad, speculation is bad. Um, what we need to do is move away from that. And Intel will move away from that, but when they move away from that, suddenly it exposes the bloated codes for everybody to see. Intel was hiding the bloated code. Now, Linux, and for that matter, Apple, does not have bloated code. They did not make bad decisions, okay? And they have, they don't need uh, what Intel did. And matter of fact, uh, Linus Torvalds basically went on a tirade when he found out what they were doing. Uh, and, you know, called Intel all kinds of names. You can read about the long list of names that he called them. But he was right about this, because Linux doesn't need that stuff. Linux works just fine. You can just load it so fast. So I believe that Meltdown and Spectre will be pivotal, even though they're on the hardware level. The fact that they are exposing the key problem of Windows is going to move people towards Linux and, and Apple. Any uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I read something about the Free Software Foundation. They're developing a project with a processor uh, to be a secure system motherboard. Yes. Yeah, so that you will control the firmware. It won't have. I love those guys. I love those guys. Great about where that's how it's far. I love the entire Linux community, but I love those guys best. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. There are things happening. This next year or two are going to be the best two years of all of our lives. Yes. I'm not super familiar with this stuff, but isn't UEFI a standard, not a piece of software that could be backdoored? Uh, no, uh, UEFI is, my, Bill Gates would like you to believe it's a standard, just like he'd like you to believe the Windows operating system is standard. I would read my book, Free Yourself from Microsoft and I have several chapters on UEFI where I go over the complete history about how it evolved, and the coding problem inside of UEFI. Now, UEFI is encrypted. I'll tell you a couple things about UEFI. You're not really going to be able to know the truth about UEFI. Now, this is a benefit of open source. You get to read the code. The general public can't read code, but some of us can read code. I can't write code very well, but I can read it. And I know when something's going wrong. Now, the other thing, however, is in addition to uh, having bloated code, a lot of the code was written in Microsoft code starting in 2007. Microsoft code is itself insecure. You can read about it in my book about the problems some coding programs are less secure than other coding programs, and some of their hash mechanisms have problems. So UEFI was done basically to give the NSA control over all of our computers. And we kind of, you know, just like we were always, I was using Windows computers for 20, I mean, since 1985, I've been using Windows computer. So, you know, it took, people were kind of slow on the uptake. What you want to do is get involved in the Core Boot Project. Uh, you can go to a website called Purism OS. Last August, they encrypted a lot of UEFI. They encrypted a lot of the Intel. Intel has something called the management engine. Right inside of the management engine is NSA code. I'm not making this up. This is not conspiracy theory. But Intel itself has been co-opted. You would be our, every server in the United States has been co-opted by um, <coughs> our own government, by your tax dollars. I have moved all my websites out of the United States because it was too easy for the government to take down my websites. And uh, they did take them down. We had a little bit of a challenge there for me to get them all back up again, but they're now all up in Canada. Okay, but nevertheless, we, there is a hell of a lot going on. We're actually winning. I know it may look like we're losing, but when you get Microsoft promoting Linux and you get Amazon promoting Linux, and stuff, this is good. This is really good for us. No, we just got to make it easier, and that's what we're going to try to do. Yeah. So this is just kind of a question about how distro tweaks the architecture of it works. Yes. Yeah. I am kind of curious, 
Well, I, I guess it makes sense because you're using a backup program, but I'm curious if your distro tweak file or folder or something like that yeah. could, instead of just kind of copying all of your files and folders, instead have like a like a batch trip to package or install yes. the software instead so that way it can be much more independent. Yes, and in fact, it's more than that. You know, I showed you that screen with all those like 20 different options that you can do. You can go in and literally it has a, a, a GUI, a graphic user interface, where you could go in and make all kinds of modifications. And if you're smart enough to make those modifications, go to it. If you want to write bash scripts, go to it. There is so much, this is the beauty of open source. The, you, you have the power to do what you want. All I'm telling you is that out of the 20 tools that I tried, Aptic was the one that worked, okay? And so I, and me being the simple person that I am, also I am very, like I said, I'm very, very fearful of other instructors. Can another teacher do this? And all I want them to do is click on the backup button. I don't want them screwing around with anything. Right, well I'm just kind of thinking like, your backup button could, or when you generate your backup file, yeah. I'm just thinking of like your students in Europe, for example, if you had your scripts generated in such a way in Aptic, yeah. that it was downloading from the Debian or Ubuntu mirrors in Europe, and that way it wasn't, you know. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah, oh, okay, you're talking about the sharing thing. Yeah, so here's my thought process about that. Even in Europe, they had the, they, a lot of use PHP. In fact, Joomla is the number one website tool in Europe. Because Joomla works in 70 different languages. That's another benefit it has over WordPress. So Europe, Joomla is the number one tool, but they're all using PHP, they're all on PHP servers. The problem is PHP. I need to have a talk with those PHP people, and if I ever run into them, I'm going to say, what are you doing limiting us at 500 megabytes? That's like nothing these days. You can't do anything with 500 megabytes. So we need at least, say, 20 gigabytes or something, you know. And, um, but until then, uh, <coughs> this was the only quick turn solution that I have. And the other thing, I'm just going to get it down underneath 500 megabytes. The people in Europe are going to have the same problem. I have lots of friends in Europe, Joomla friends. The whole Joomla community practically is over there. And the, um, it is going to be a challenge for people over there, but, you know, they actually are way ahead of us. Uh, they, they're really into Linux over there, and they're really into Joomla over there. And they, they don't like Google or much other. They're always taken to the court and stuff. So yeah, Europe is actually probably ahead of us in a lot of ways. Okay. But good point, yeah. The PHP I and I, you do have to modify that to bump the limit. Yeah, and so I I teach yeah, courses and that kind of stuff. And and so I wanted to modify the limit. And yes, I could go into the control settings and I try to modify the limit. And believe me, I've been working with some of the people at PHP about this and, and the server company is company called Polo Stuff in Canada. We, you know, they go, hey, listen, you know, we're not the ones that have created this problem. And I literally went to the PHP manual to see this can't be true. Oh my God, these idiots, you know. How could they do something like that to me? So I'm going to get on the PHP committee and we're going to get that limit changed and then we won't have so many problems. But right now, you, there is, I am very certain, I spent several months trying to increase the PHP limit. You can't go above 500 megabytes, not right now. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming and I hope to see you. You guys all have my email address. I want you trying to... Try out DistroTweak, send me any information you have about it. This is just the beginning of a new wonderful world. Thank you.